welcome everybody. I think everybody is in from the waiting room now into the main room. Um, welcome to this evening's community conversation. Um, my name is Helen Williams and I'm chairing tonight's meeting. Um, I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction just to explain the format of the meeting and then I'll introduce some of the um, people from the council who are here. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm Helen. I, I live locally. I live in West Twickenham. Uh, and I've lived here for 16 years. Um, and some of you might know me from Friends of Twickenham Green. I was the chair until last year. Um, we're also joined tonight by our ward councillors. So from South Twickenham, we've got Richard Bennett, Michael Butlin and Katie Mansfield. And from West Twickenham, we've got Piers Allen, Alan Juriance and Helen Lee Parsons, I hope, though I haven't seen her name, I'm hoping she is here. Um, we've also got um, a back, back office team, including the community engagement officer from um, London Borough of Richmond on Thames, who is going to be writing up notes um, and actions uh, following tonight's meeting. Um, if you have been to one of these events before, you'll know that the council has been running um, online Zoom events this year to involve the local community. And because um, a big theme that came up earlier on this year was around community safety, this, this event this evening is, is all about um, community safety. Um, and so we're, we're hoping that some of you have been able to post some questions in advance, um, and we're hoping that the people attending tonight's meeting will address that in their presentations. Um, you will be able to ask questions so you can put them in the chat and what you're going to do is to put question and then the subject of it. Um, my suggestion is you wait until you've heard the presentations by the people that are going to be speaking tonight and if they don't address something that you particularly want to have addressed on the theme of community safety uh, please feel free to put that in the chat and as we go through the evening I'm going to try and pull all the um, um, questions together and try and group them so that we've got similar things um, dealt with at the same time. If towards the end of the meeting we have any time left and we have a chance to um, discuss any other matters then we will do so but obviously the, the prime purpose is around community safety. Um, just a few points that I need to make you aware of before we um, start tonight's meeting. Um, this event is being recorded and it will be published after the event on the Council website. Um, you'll all be muted, so when we come to the question part of it, I will signal your name and then um, the, the back office people will unmute you and will call you into the conversation. Um, and if you are asking a question, it'd be really good if you could turn your camera on, please. Um, you have been sent the event etiquette, and obviously I'm sure we'll all be really respectful during this meeting of uh, other people's views and opinions, and we will uh, listen respectfully. Um, and if, if there are any issues, then um, the event host, who is not me, I know I'm Dan as host, but it won't be me, will be pulling you outside into another room, just having a, a quiet word. Um, I think that's all I've got to say, other than to say um, this is non-party political, so you're asked very kindly not to make any, any political statements. Okay, I haven't introduced a few other people that are with us tonight. We've also got from the police, um, Rebecca Robinson, Inspector Rebecca Robinson. And we've got PCs, uh, Russ Woolcott, and I think Ray Sullivan, his name just gone off the screen. So I think that's who we've got with us tonight. We've got uh, from the Police Liaison Group and Safer Neighbourhood team, we've got Claire Head, who is the chair of South Twickenham PRG. And I'm hoping we're gonna be joined by Ray Williams, who's the West Twickenham PRG. We've also got Carol Atkinson from the Safer Neighbourhoods Board. Okay, I think I've introduced everybody and I think I've gone through all the bits and pieces I have to do. So we're going to start off with um, a short update from our ward councillors. So I'm going to go to South Twickenham first and Councillor Richard Bennett, please. Good. 
I'm unmuted. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try and set a, an admirable example to my fellow councillors by being quite quick. And I'm sure everyone will be quite pleased about that. Um, so I, I know that in terms of community safety issues, people are, are worried about alcohol and drinking, particularly on Twickenham Green in the summer. Um, drug dealing potentially in, as well, which is also taking place. They're interested in antisocial behaviour, interested in the police resources that we're receiving, uh, park guard, and probably things like CCTV. So I guess those are the things that are going to crop up today. Um, I, I, I'm going to just mention something on CCTV because um, at one of the council committees, um, we had a discussion about CCTV. TV coverage. And I know everyone has this view that we're absolutely a surveyed, thoroughly surveyed society. In fact, actually, we have only 75 fixed CCTV cameras in the borough. And almost all of those are actually in the shopping centres, the main ones in Twickenham and Richmond. So there's about one in South Twickenham, and there's probably about one in West Twickenham, I would think. So very few. Certainly compared with somewhere like Wandsworth, that had 10 has 10 times the number of cameras. And we were reviewing the usage of that. Disappointingly, there were no police at, that, at the review we had. So I'd be quite interested to hear their, their view on it because there are, there are issues about you know, the number of cameras, the portability, because we have about another half dozen that can be moved around, but we have to get police permission to move them. And the, we also have issues about looking at the CCV, CTV footage and the police involvement in that. So I would be interested in getting the police input during the meeting about the use of CCTV and also whether we're getting the, the right coverage for it. So I'm, these, I'm just interested in the same topics as you and I'll have some views and maybe I can chip in and get a view later on. Um, or one, one thing I will say that it's a little bit of an update that some people will be interested in is on, on uh, the Radnor Gardens Cafe, where the expectation is that we will have a new, um, have the cafe reopened sometime in February. So that is the current expectation. So a little bit of an update there, but um, I, I'm here and hopefully there'll be questions and things that um, I might get involved in answering, but I'll pass across to Katie, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, and, and I think just to reiterate what Richard has, has already said, I think we appreciate the community safety concerns and we're really um, looking forward to the debate this evening and hearing from the interested parties because we, we do get um, communication with regard to the antisocial um, behaviour on Twickenham Green and, all, and also in other parts and, and the police presence. Um, and, and, and other things that have come up, I know, over, over recent weeks have been um, things like the, the wearing of masks and the enforcement of the wearing of masks and, and whether the, the premises, some of the shops, whether people feel safe going into those because they feel that other people aren't necessarily following the guidelines in the same way. So I think it's really important that we we have the chance to talk through some of these this evening. I did want to take the opportunity, a bit like Richard with the um, Rad Radnor Gardens Cafe, just to give a couple more updates um, across the ward from other concerns that we're getting and that we're hearing from people, um, ju just because it's an opportunity to share this with, um, with people. We, we have um, a, another community conversation happening next Monday, um, and that is specifically to discuss the St Richard Reynolds um, School Street and the impact that that had on local residents and the school community as well. Um, lots of positive, lots of negative feedback. And what we really want to do on Monday is listen to some of that feedback to see whether we should be amending what is there. Um, I wanted to give an update on Twickenham Green in terms of the, the treatment of the grass on Twickenham Green. I know that's come up a lot with regard to it was so used, so great to see it used last summer. But what it has meant is that the grass has been in a very bad state. So um, the technical amongst you, I mean, we've done the verti draining, we've done the fertiliser and, and we've now done the reseeding as well for, for Twickenham Green over the winter period. Um, we've had a lot of um, good submissions in terms of the local area fund and we were taking a couple on to the next stage but there still is an opportunity for people to to put in ideas into the local area fund and we're really keen to see some of those 
talking to residents quite a lot in the area by Crossdeep Gardens, Tennyson and Radnor Road in terms of the cut through where people are coming down there. And there's been a lot of angst in that local um, community um, with regard to the traffic and the speeding of traffic coming down there. So we're looking at what we can do with regard to that. And I know that Michael particularly has been doing a lot with regard to the recycling units across the ward in terms of the location of them and making sure that they're appropriate for the local community. So just try to give a few updates, but I'm really <coughs> involved in this conversation on on community safety this evening thank you thank you katie can we go to peers now please yes thanks okay um there are three initiatives i'd particularly like to highlight that together across the ward from west to uh, to north to east um first we've been reviewing the applications for ward-based local area uh fund and we're particularly keen to work on the scheme to improve the access and visibility of the public playground located near the entrance of the David Lloyd Club in Staines Road. The access is poor from the main road and some nearby residents, are, are, many nearby residents are actually unaware of the public immunity. We'd like to introduce a new path that, that moves users away uh, of the playground away from vehicles, signage to make the playground more visible, and also look at updating the play equipment and improve signage within the uh, public golf course. The second highlight is the support councils are giving to Friends of Nether Gardens in their application to the Richmond Community Fund for adding a community indoor space to Nelly Gardens Pavilion that could also be used by KG Cafe and other community groups as an indoor space. We think this project, which has already received planning permission, would enhance a great community asset in the ward um, and, that, uh, and also benefit residents in neighbouring wards. Even if the application to the Richmond Community Fund is, success, is successful, the friends have to match fund and we hope that the community will be uh, generous in their in in, in when the campaign gets going perhaps in in uh, later in March. Um, finally, we'd like to highlight um, particularly the uh, uh, the school streets, the two school streets schemes in our ward. Um, one one of them is in Elmsley Road for the Drafalgar schools. Um, the other is in First Cross Road for the Jack and Jill School. That also benefits parents walking their children to. Archdeacon Cambridge School at Hampton Road. Um, the, uh, these pilot schemes, uh, these are pilot schemes at the moment, and while the Emsley Road scheme has quickly established itself, the school street in First Cross Road, which restricts access to vehicles mm. from 8.15 to 9.45 in the morning and 2.30 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon uh, during term time, um, it is taking a little bit longer to establish. And so we're very pleased that local residents of First Cross Road are helping to uh, the school to implement the scheme for volunteers by volunteering morning and afternoon to man a temporary barrier this week and next, and the first two weeks of the, after Christmas. So if you're in support of the scheme, but encourages more children to walk uh, safely to school and take traffic away, away from uh, of these two schools, do please get in touch, particularly if you'd like to join the volunteers next week and in the new year. And we look forward to obviously any questions on other issues in the war, particularly those that touch on community safety, the theme of tonight's community conversation. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move now to um, a short introduction from Claire Head. I can't actually see that uh, Ray Williams is, is here, Claire. Is, okay, I I've unmuted. Okay, he, he was here, sorry. He is. Yeah, he is. He is. Okay, right. So we're having a presentation from Claire Head and Ray Williams uh, from the, um, the police liaison groups. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, very, very briefly, and I know we haven't got much time, but I really would like to plead for the case of the people around Twickenham Green. Um, they're suffering, an awful lot of them, from people urinating, defecating in their, on, on their property, and um, they're not getting anything done, it seems. Um, as the chairman of the police liaison group for South Twickenham, we have um, police attending and they've said we go there at 10.30 in the morning. Um, I'm sorry, that that's not when the problems occur. Um, the police have been seen, they, they are at a distance. I know it must be difficult. People who are on Twickenham Green causing a disturbance are not very nice people. And when residents try 
and remonstrate with them, they um, they get violent. So it's a really unpleasant situation. And it's basically because there are about five or six outlets around the green which sell alcohol. Now, I understand, and this, uh, this is a question, that um, Sainsbury's has had its hours shortened. Um, not sure about that. If they have, that's wonderful. I was at the licensing committee when the Sainsbury's representative said, everybody around Sainsbury's has got licenses that start at, I think, seven o'clock in the morning and go right through to 11, and this is the problem. Um, so can I make a huge plea for something to be done about this continual problem on Twickenham Green? And if we could have a, um, a, a toilet there, um, Arthur's is not allowing people to use their toilet. It's not in their planning permission. So they people can't go there. And there's a huge problem. Um, yes. Oh, by the way, I'm chairman of the Friends of Radnor Gardens. Um, and we were the um, charity which asked the previous cafe runners to leave for extremely important reasons. And we have handed the running of the cafe, our charity, back to the council. And I have been told that the cafe will be open um, in December. And here we are in December and it isn't. But um, I, that's what I understand. I had a meeting on site about a week ago, but um, the new owners are from Brew, Brew Cafe and they are a chain. That's me done. Thank you very much, Claire. Sorry, Ray, I didn't see you there earlier. Would you like that's to okay. go I think I think what I did, I actually changed from Jenny to Ray Williams. That may have confused. Ah, oh, yes, it probably and, did. Um, a very uh, a subtle change. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, my my thoughts were to start with to try and um, maybe just sell the idea of PLGs a little bit. I don't know. Some of the people who are here may not be uh, that aware what what PLG is, and I um I thought I could take this opportunity to sort of drum up a bit more support, really. Um, uh, for those who don't know, you know, police liaison groups are are there really to um, give uh, the all new residents just uh, you, you could be you know, neighbourhood watch uh, coordinator, but simply uh, uh, just a simple resident uh, to have uh, access both to uh, your local safer neighbourhood safer neighbourhood team uh, and also to your councillors because at our police liaison group meetings we. Um, we have both, we usually have at least one of our councillors and very often three. Um, our, our West Twickenham uh, 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 PLG meeting is in um, held in Watergrave uh, Road School. So we usually have a fairly uh, uh, a comfortable and warm uh, 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 facility for doing our meetings. And we meet from about half seven till nine o'clock. We have to get out at nine o'clock because it's <coughs> very uh, insistent on that. Um, we have uh, at those meetings we can be told uh, about uh, latest crime statistics. We get very good information from our own safe and able team and from the, uh, the Met themselves. They supply good statistics, so it's really a really good uh, venue for that. Um, what we also have, of course, is apart we can go round and we can ask everybody what they've uh, seen and those. Very often we find that the, the, the issues, I think, uh, as uh, Claire has suggested, the, the issues we get are, are very often dual. Uh, they're both police and councillors. So it's really, it's really useful to have both of them run at the same time. Um, we've got one such issue in West Twickenham at the moment. Um, we had a rather... Uh, 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 alarming uh, and fairly unusual, could be completely unusual, I think, where we had an instance where a young schoolboy was um, held at knife point and uh, uh, walked to a rather dimly lit alley and had his bike stolen. Now, obviously, this is a police matter and the police are doing 
what they can. Obviously, these 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 sorts of guys are very difficult to track down the culprit. But also, uh, this has caused the local residents to be um, really quite concerned about the, the the lighting in that alley. It's it's fairly long, it's fairly narrow, and I think it's got one light in the middle. Um, and they would they would do more reassured if um, the lighting could be improved. Now that's obviously a, a local council issue. Uh, there are formal, of course, there are formal ways in which these issues are dealt with. Um, but the sort of the PLG meeting where you would have both the police who could um, talk to this issue, you have councillors who could put the council's view on these things, obviously it comes with cost. Um, and so this is really, um, I think, I think it's a really useful forum. And um, I would uh, uh, ask anyone who lives in West Twickenham um, who, who feels they would like to take an interest, um, um, please contact me and, and see if they can join. Um, and I think the, um, we've actually not had any meetings uh, since the lockdown. We managed to get one in in March and we haven't any since, but we've been persuaded to uh, try this method. And we are going to meet tomorrow. <coughs> and our first um, PLG meeting is going to be, in fact, uses MS uh, Teams because that's the only uh, sort of video <coughs> platform that the police can use. So tomorrow we're, we're going to try our meeting uh, an MS team. So that's where it's twicking from. Thank you very much. And I should say that following the meeting, um, attendees will be emailed a list of um, contacts. So you will be able to, to get in touch with um, the chairs of the PLGs or your local councillors if you wanted to follow anything up in particular. Um, I'm really sorry, I forgot to introduce you at the beginning, Mark. So we're now going to have um, a very short presentation from Mark Wolski um, from the London Borough of Richmond upon Thames. His role is, I think, a community safety officer about domestic violence, and he's just going to talk to you about White Ribbondale, I believe. All right. uh, good evening, Chair, and thank you very much for inviting me this evening. I'm the Vulnerabilities Manager for, for, for Richmond, and so my, my my responsibility encompasses violence against women and girls. I'd like to just, uh, my purpose for me being here this evening is to raise awareness regarding domestic, talk a little bit about White River, and then go over seven key areas of information and hopefully provide you a little bit of a context about domestic abuse, violence against women and girls in the local area. Let me start about, about White Ribbon Day, 25th of November. Uh, it's known as the International Day for the Eradication of Violence Against Women and Girls, it's an annual day uh, to raise awareness in respect of family violence. It actually originated in 1960 after the three Mirabel sisters, political activists in the Dominican Republic, were assassinated. Their deaths were actually passed off as car accidents. And it actually received uh, UN recognition in 1999. So there's some, some little history behind this that uh, maybe not many of us are actually aware of. So what is domestic abuse and domestic violence? Domestic abuse is categorised as any incident that happens controlling or coercive or threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been to the past or family members. So it's quite expansive and it encompasses a physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse and financial abuse. So it does... I'm really sorry, yeah, your voice keeps picking in and out. Could you perhaps not put your hands in front yeah. of your, your face? Yeah. I think it might be um, that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So if I can talk about maybe seven key facts in relation to uh, domestic abuse. We know that domestic abuse is 40% underreported in the United Kingdom. That which is reported is 1.2 million crimes a year. Risk 100,000 adults are at risk of serious harm or murder each year. And victims of domestic abuse often uh, live with the domestic abuse two to three years before actually seeking assistance. It's estimated that three women a week take their own lives as a result of domestic abuse. Children, around 18% of children in domestic abuse households are injured as a result. The cost of domestic abuse is astounding. £34,000 a case. A homicide is estimated to cost £3.2 million. Now, for the local area, for Richmond, there are around 2,000 incidents a year, 1,200 crimes per, per year. And that is one of the biggest uh, areas of demand for police and the biggest areas of risk for the police to manage. 
for the financial year to date, uh, that's the coronavirus period, uh, domestic abuse has increased by 5.9%. And when one considers over the past five years, the numbers have been pretty static. It's quite, it's quite a hike. But beyond that, locally in West Twickenham, contributes 6% of um, all domestic abuse. And South Twickenham contributes 5.9%. Uh, and this is a quite a stark statistic as well. Locally, we have a conference, a, a monthly conference called the Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference. And the volume of cases going through that conference has increased by 47% during the coronavirus period. Uh, that's 31 cases per month at higher risk of serious harm or homicide. The demands on our local advocacy services provided by Refuge have risen, approaching 50% compared to the same quarter last year. So I'll go on to my five myths about domestic abuse. It only happens to a certain type of person. Nonsense. People choose abusive partners. Nonsense. It's just your domestic row. All couples have them. Nonsense. Children don't see the abuse, so not affected. Equally. Nonsense. Not round here. Nonsense. And because these are some of the preconceptions that are often articulated um, quite widely, um, and now are now myth. So four things to look look for, perhaps, in terms of domestic abuse. Friends and family, perhaps feeling more stressed or worried all of the time, feeling nauseous, feeling scared when your partner is angry because you can't predict their behaviour. Feelings of pressure to change who you are moving through a relationship further than you actually want to and those folks who feel like they're walking on eggshells consistently and locally going down to one of my third facts you may or may not be aware uh, that we've currently got three domestic homicide reviews that are ongoing so that's current cases that uh, have been the, the homicides took place in uh, uh, within the last 18 months two years uh, one, the case of Laurelyn Garcia Boberto, a French national, um, in 2019. It's a live review that we're conducting. Leila Arezzo um, and Akbar Arezzo um, killed uh, by, their, by their son. Uh, you may be aware of that, the double homicide. And there's, an, there's another homicide review we're looking at in relation to uh, some proceedings that are going through the coronial courts at the, at the moment. So I can't mention any names. So it does happen around here. And you may recall within the past, I think, two and a half years, there was a case of a family from South America where the husband uh, murdered his, uh, his wife and then he murdered the children and took his own life that uh, she had. It does happen everywhere. Then going down through to two ways to seek help beyond phoning the police. Um, and this information is available on the local authority website. Um, there's the local refuge service. Uh, give support and the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. I shan't give the phone numbers here, but they are available. And so my key, my key message uh, to, to everybody, and I, I know I've, I've given a canter through some harsh statistics, would be that domestic abuse is unacceptable. It does cut across all communities. Survivors and victims and families, that you're, you're not alone. Help is out there. Help is available via the police case of emergency there are a number of agencies that are able to help and provide assistance and advice is also available through the through the local authority and on our web pages so can i just say thank you for inviting me to talk about domestic abuse it is um, um in many respects a dark subject and in my humble opinion it's a subject that doesn't get enough airtime um, in the community safety agenda it merits far more airtime it merits far more scrutiny interest and intrusion um, from, from communities and from politicians and from senior leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. That was, that was very useful. Okay, I'm going to move on now to um, a short update from the local police about key issues in the um, local area. Um, I'm hoping that um, Inspector Robinson is going to be able to speak to this. Yeah, hello everybody. I'll keep it really, really brief because I want to give you as much chance as possible to ask your, your questions um, to myself and the council. Um, so my name is Rebecca Robinson. I'm the inspector in charge of the safe neighbourhood teams for the whole of Richmond. Um, so that's all 18 wards. Also on the call are the dedicated wards officers, uh, Ray Sullivan and Russ Wilcock for Twickenham. 
Um, so we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Um, in terms of crime, we've had a somewhat different year um, this year with, with COVID. We did see obviously crime go down a lot in the first lockdown that then has risen uh, after that. It's a bit too soon really to see the impact of the last four weeks uh, specifically on the crime figures. Um, but we did over the last four weeks uh, secure a bit of extra funding to have some extra officers out in Richmond uh, where ASB warning, where warning notices were given and stop and searches and arrests um, have been done over the last four weeks. And we're pushing forward now into uh, what we call uh, our winter plan um, in terms of focusing on, on robbery, areas of ASB, areas of high harm. Um, so we'll be moving forward um, into that. Uh, obviously aware that COVID is, is a big concern to everyone. Um, we've had specialist uh, COVID cars dealing from our response team who will deal with concerns, um, areas of risk for groups of six or more. Um, however, they do, our response team does service uh, both Twickenham and Kingston. So that will very much depend where the risk is. Um, Richmond does remain one of the safest boroughs, but as I always say on this call, that doesn't mean that you should deserve any less of a service uh, from the Metropolitan Police. Um, and I'm always very passionate when I go into resources meetings to secure those resources for you. Uh, we have some extra probation office, probationary officers, so brand new officers that will be joining us uh, on six month rotation uh, from January, which will be good to, to boost the numbers. And they'll be going into the, the areas of, of higher risk. And um, we're just working very closely with our special constables and also with our council because we are very limited now on numbers, unfortunately. You know, each ward only has two dedicated ward officers and one PCSO. Um, you know, whereas two years ago, my job would have been done by three inspectors. It's, it's now just me and same with the sergeants. But that doesn't mean we're any less passionate about, about giving you the service that you deserve. Um, anyway, I would just very quickly just hand on, if I could, to um, Ray and Russ to give more of a local update. They were there. They were together. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan Ross. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm from West Twickenham Ward, uh, Policing Ward, um, and obviously our main focus, um, our main priorities are set by the Police Liaison Group, uh, which currently are theft from motor vehicle, um, antisocial behaviour in the Nella Gardens area, and um, burglaries, including scams and bogus callers, stuff like that. That's our one of our main focus that the police liaison group want us to focus on. We also do a lot of work to get as a Twickenham cluster, uh, which involves uh, Ray's team on South Twickenham, Heathfield and Hampton Hill. Um, we'll, so we sort of work together to combat certain things. One of the things is uh, drug offences that we do a lot of work towards and um, antisocial behaviour across the, across the whole cluster. Um, doing stop and searches, being out in the community, foot patrol, stuff like that. Um, also, one of our main, uh, main jobs we do nowadays <clears throat> is to do uh, being a, a, a platform on social media. Um, this includes uh, Twitter, uh, our next door. So we're trying to sort of communicate with our community as much as we can. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Ray. Uh, I'm South Twickenham. Uh, police officer, obviously, uh, if you've never met me before, hello. But uh, yeah, the main problems we have on South Twickenham is a uh, theft from motor vehicle, which also includes catalytic converter theft, uh, theft of pedal cycles, which comes under the burglary banner because we have a lot of shed thefts, and also ASB on Twickenham Green. We've tried to do a few jobs around the theft of pedal cycles, bike marking things, a bit of crime prevention and stuff. Uh, theft from motor vehicle, we arrested someone last week and recovered some stolen property who was quite prolific over the summer. And the ASB, we've been working, we've got a meeting tomorrow with our crime prevention hub and uh, we're looking to uh, issue, start issuing, we've got 10 suspects to issue ASB warnings on for uh, their behaviour over the summer, and we'll be looking to roll this out as we go into Christmas. Any questions? 
Okay, I think we'll um, we'll put the questions in the chat. Um, I think, and, and I'll try and group them them together. Um, okay, so that's the end of our um, presentations uh, for this evening. What I'm going to do now um, is um, we don't have many questions, so I'd like people to to maybe indicate by putting in the chat if they have any questions, maybe for the police or for our local councillors, starting with the theme of community safety. I can see one from um, Betsy. Um, and um, we've got another question about another um, matter, which um, we'll come to at the end if we have time. OK, there's um, a question from Victoria about e-scooters. Can I go to Victoria Nurse next, please? I'm having trouble unmuting you, Victoria. I wonder whether one of the back office people could do that. I can't unmute Victoria. Sorry, Helen, that, I think it's there we go. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I had a question about e-scooters. Um, so recently uh, TfL announced that they wanted to kind of uh, spread out, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, to spread out trial runs of rental e-scooters um, and I was wondering if uh, Richmond Council was thinking about doing that or if they are going to start doing that um, because I have obviously quite a few concerns um, already at the moment. Um, I've actually got clipped by an e-scooter user the other week um, and unfortunately their arm went and hit the uh, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair and their arm went and hit the uh, joystick. Um, so obviously there's me riding off. Um, so I had some concerns about uh, the safety of um, residents, you know, pedestrians, regardless of disabled or not. So uh, push chair, um, you know, buggy users, wheelchair users, walker users and so on and so forth. Um, and also I've seen a few, and I don't know if they are from a rental scheme or not, have been on pavements, like left on pavements, like strewn across. Um, so yeah, that was a few of concerns. So, um, and my third concern is obviously seeing a lot of them using the cycle lanes. And we already um, have a huge concern, especially in this borough, due to the high numbers of cyclists that we have. Um, about getting hit by vehicles. So I have a huge concern about e-scooter users also being hit by said vehicles as well, um, especially as they have absolutely no protection. A lot of them do not use helmets or anything um, to protect themselves with like cyclists do. So that's a few of my concerns that just came up in my head. So I hope you can answer them for me. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of points there that I think we could have answered by different um, people. I wonder if I could go to in Inspector Robinson first. Would you like to comment on the, yeah. um, the, the safety element from a police um, aspect, please? Yeah, of course. Um, and this is a concern that's, that's um, been similar across many of these community conversations. So we, we are aware of your concerns. Uh, obviously, when the scheme first came out you know the position from uh, the Met as a whole is to support the government initiative however um, they are mechanically propelled vehicles these e-scooters and as such they are subject to uh, different highway laws and uh, different legislation under road traffic including cycling on pavement um, because they are relatively new we're still sort of getting our, our understanding um, of that law coming coming down to the officers on the street. There are specific uh, operations around targeting e-scooters uh, and our colleagues in safer transport are looking at them. Um, but yeah, it is, it is an offence for them to be cycling on the pavement. Uh, and then if officers uh, see it, they will obviously uh, deal with it. Okay, thank you very much. Now, there was a second part of Victoria's question, which was um, around the, the council and whether the council are preparing to, to license e-scooters. And I don't know if one of our councillors would indicate by waving at me whether they'd like to answer that question. Katie. 
Hi, um, I, I think that we have to get the balance right um, with how we go forward with e-scooters because there's a couple of different considerations. One is that we have to do everything we can to try and improve the environment and try to um, make sure that we're a borough that encourages active travel and that ensures that the opportunities are there for people to cycle, to walk and to get by through means that aren't only um, through through. Um, cars at the moment. But I think you're right, absolutely right, Victoria, there is a complete balance that has to be made with the safety considerations. Um, and I think it's something that we have been discussing um, internally at Council. It's something that people have divergent views on. Um, and, and I think that certainly, um, when we've been talking about it, the safety concerns have been absolutely paramount that if there is anything that would go forward um, with, with regard to, to us allowing a, a trial to take place, it would have to be with a lot of constraints of safety involved in it. Thank you. Victoria, did you want to ask a supplementary or do you feel that your um, questions have been answered? Um, I, I feel that my questions have been answered. Um, there was one thing that I was thinking of. Um, to This is kind of directed to the police officers on here. Is Are there any thoughts in regards to, um, well, particularly for our local area anyway, or for the borough, to encourage some form of um, advertisement um, in terms of encouraging e-scooter users to use a helmet or um, to be more aware um, in terms yeah. of their safety, something like that, just to, just to kind yeah. of put into mind that to encourage um, at least helmet using um, would be maybe a good idea. So I was just wondering if uh, the police officers may be um, wanting to take something like that on board um, yeah. just no, to change you. the avenue yeah no thank you that's um that's a really good idea actually and something i'm not previously thought of um perhaps i can take that offline with uh, my colleagues in the council to and the community safety unit in the council to see what we can do jointly around that because like, yeah you're completely right it is a concern okay thank you very much i'm going to to go back to something that that oh Ray, did you want to come in there? Ray Williams? Yeah, I, I think I've, I've actually seen, um, uh, I think we were sent through this OWL system, weren't we? Um, uh, uh, a, a letter that the Met uh, sent to retailers of e-scooters. And that seems to be saying that, reminding them that uh, uh, the use of an electric scooter on the road is illegal um, at the moment. And that uh, I think that's why they have, they prefer rental systems, isn't it? Because they can be registered and logged. So I think the Met is sending a, a letter to all retailers of these, reminding them when people buy it, they should be told you're not allowed to use it on the road and you're not allowed to use it on the pavement. So at the moment, you can only really use it in a private property, I think. I think that's correct. Um, Rebecca, could you add to that? Ha have the Met issued um, letters to, to retailers to make sure that they're being marketed responsibly? Do you know? Um, I, I don't know. I'd have no. to come back come no. back on that one. I can certainly find out though. Okay, I'm going to tell you, I can see there's a couple of hands up. Michael, did you want to come in here? Michael Butlin about um, e-scooters? Yes, um, first and foremost, e-scooters that you've seen around the borough are actually illegal. The reason being is that these vehicles do not have any rules and regulations on their use on public highways. And that is quite clear. Uh, and some uh, police uh, groups have actually taken them off the group, taken the e-scooters the e away. The thing that you hear about at the moment is that the uh, Transport for London are feeling towards some tests which are very firmly controlled. The individuals who will be using the test sites will effectively, A, have to have a driving license to start with. B, um, they are I'm told that the vehicles themselves, the, the e-scooters themselves will actually be monitored in terms of speeds. So that depending where you are, um, the, the speed will actually reduce if, if not, um, come to us. If you try and go off, off scoop, uh, it, it completely banned it off. So this Transport for London test is very controlled, 
environment. It's nothing to do with all those e-scooters you see around. It's possibly the uh, the government's basically trying to tip the toe in the because because they are so prevalent and they do need to have an answer. And it's not the um, problems about the uh, helmets you should think about. Um, if they're nipping along at 30 miles an hour, uh, as somebody who came off his bicycle at five miles an hour and broke a leg, um, I can assure you that an e-scooter person, well, they've got nothing. You know, they've got nothing to stop, hang on to, to stop themselves really going over the handlebars. Even if you look at some of the paving stones, a little bump, a little curve, and they can come off. So they're actually endangering themselves and obviously endangering us as well, us pedestrians. And um, so if anything you see on the road at the moment, they are completely illegal. There will be a test possibly um, coming forth but that will be in a very controlled manner. And uh, we, it, should we adopt that procedure, we can also jump out of it uh, if we see it's getting out of control. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, just to wrap up this conversation on e-scooters, um, Inspector Robinson, I wonder if you could just give any advice for local residents about what they should do if they see that um, e-scooters are a, a problem in their neighbourhood. Who should we refer it to? And yeah, so if you, you do have any such concerns like that, please do report it in uh, via, via the 101 system or online. Um, it's always good for us um, to, to know. You might not necessarily, if, I, if I'm honest, get a, a police response immediately because it will depend very much on how many officers are on, what other risk, are, what else is going on um, across the southwest of London. But it's still important for us to know where the issues are because that then gets filtered to the safe neighbourhood teams. Um, and, you know, uh, Russ and, and Ray can target uh, their patrols accordingly, according to when it, where any ASB is. So it's always handy for us to know. Thank you. That's, that's really good advice. Um, I'm going to sort of move around the chat a little bit, just sort of trying to think about grouping things together a bit. Um, Paul Tanto's um, logged a question here about the police view of the impact of the 20 mile an hour um, um, speed limit on road safety. Um, Paul, do you want to ask your question to the police? Uh, no, happy for him to answer as read. Thanks. Okay. So, Inspector Robinson, would you like to comment on that? What's the impact of the 20 mile an hour um, road um, speed limit? Um, to be honest, I would have to, that's a question for our colleagues um, in, in safer transport. Um, so I would have to take that away. But again, I'm happy to come back on that. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to stick with the, um, the other question that we had earlier on from Betsy. Betsy, do you want to say anything more to your question? You're um, a bit concerned about the theft of um, milk and some deliveries on doorsteps and you're asking for advice from the Safer Neighbourhood team. Do you want to say any more to that or do you just want the, the police to, to speak to no, it? No, I think I should say more. Um, the thefts have been going on for probably two or more months. Um, they were happening to me individually, and then last week when I had everything taken um, out of a cool box, I realized it was not the foxes. Um, I did report this um, online, but of course it is a minor crime um, and was um, investigated out because I couldn't identify the perpetrators. I understand the system. I worked for the Met for 15 years. I'm clear about a number of things. Um, I'm clinically vulnerable now because I'm going through chemotherapy. Um, so I canceled Milk and More, but my neighbors, uh, this happened to a lot of neighbors on two streets because we have a, a support yeah. WhatsApp. Um, so I gathered as much inf information and did my own investigation before I contacted the Met. Um, but my sense is this, is this was much more systematic. It was taking um, 10 to 20 um, uh, bottles a day. I mean, a day. So this is something beyond consumption. It was not um, it's, it's not a one of, and it was happening systematically. Um, that was noted in the one uh, in the online crime thing, but not noted. Uh, I mean, it was just sifted out. I, again, I, I know what the sifting out does, um, but it is, it's, it's different than anti, it is more than antisocial behavior. It's, it's, it's an accumulative effect on two streets. Um, I, I would guarantee this is happening 
further up as well if I was in other people's WhatsApp. So it's, it is more than just my theft. It is, it's happening on two streets. It's happening systematically over months. And um, I, I give the advice I can, because I, again, I worked in the Met for 15 years, um, but I think you just need to note that actually it has had an impact in this area. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a completely fair um, point because when we talk about, you know, how we do have to prioritise in terms of uh, risk, that doesn't mean that a crime isn't a crime. And especially, as you said, if this is going on, um, I don't know if, uh, Ray, Russ, are we aware of these two streets that are suffering? If not, maybe, because sometimes what happens is the crime as you said, as you will know, gets sort of filtered out almost before it gets to the safe neighborhood teams. So that's why it's really important to feed food to the neighborhood teams um, where these are, where issues like this that are having uh, impact on, especially a couple of streets, it's, it's worth us knowing about. So if we could maybe have the name of the streets. Yep, I've given you the names of the streets. I'm happy to be um, Talbot Road and Marsh Farm Roads. Um, you can come and talk to me as well. I'm happy to do that and give you the background. Um, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, yeah. Yeah, I picked up this report last week. I did view it, uh, it come through the electronic reporting thing. Uh, what I would need to have a look at is if there is any patterns, because it was only one report from you. So uh, though it's not something that would come be screened out to me, it's something I would look at. So I am aware of it. I, I'm, by all means, I'll come and speak to you and find out whether I can work out some sort of pattern of when- Yeah, it was Wednesdays. Happened. I can give you the exact days. I can give you the exact times of the deliveries. I've, I've done my milk and more investigation. <laughs> um, so I've, I have done mm. that. Um, and, and, if, and if we need to get addresses of verifying other, like my neighbors, we can probably do that as well. Yeah, that's fine. If I can work out a pattern, then I can work out I can work the path. I've worked the pattern, so I can give you the work out of the pattern. <laughs> okay, because it in your crime report, it didn't have the pattern on there. It just I so, I knew there was only so much they would deal mm. with, so I because it, it so was only mine. I tried to get other people to report, mm. but if it's too two two things of a of a you know if it's if it's two bottles of milk every week, they weren't. They were just getting their money back from the company. Mm. That's what happened. Thank um, you. And okay. So can I suggest maybe that um, if you, you can follow that up, police, with, um, with Betsy directly, that'd be really um, helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, I've got, I haven't got many other questions here. Are these particular questions that people want to ask? Just put the word question and then, then put in the, the topic that you want to, uh, to, to ask about. Um, Bartley, this isn't a question, but you'd like to, um, to talk about what you did on Twickenham Green with the police on Friday night. Yes, yes. okay, I'm just trying to unmute myself. <laughs> Oh, can you turn this down? Yeah, you're a bit echoey, but you are unmuted. All right, one right, second, let me fix that. Is that better? That's much better. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yes, um, it's just by chance. Um, I actually spent quite a bit of time with the police in a patrol car on Friday evening. And um, we travelled around... Twickenham, Strawberry Hill, Teddington and the general area and at one point we were passing uh, Twickenham Green and there were quite a lot of as usual pretty much every weekend sort of um, groups of people mainly sort of young people on the green sort of groups of between 8 and 12, 13 people in each group. Anyway the, we, the patrol car had pulled up just next to the recycling on the corner next to First Cross Road and one of the PCs went across to the pavilion briefly and came back. He then radioed in and said, um, he suggested that some units attended the green because he'd seen significant evidence of drug usage taking, ASB taking place at that time. And um, he suggested that some units attend and perhaps uh, he also suggested um, you know, maybe some stop and search 
would be useful. And um, you know, this is something we witness all the time, but uh, I don't know, people seem to sort of downplay it, but this was actually radioed across to the police there. During the evening, we also stopped off at um, Radnor Gardens and, and the police entered next to the, uh, the gazebo, the entrance sort of in the middle from the road there. There were two large groups of youths there, all with bicycles. As soon as the police entered, they scarpered for better of a word. Um, before they could be approached. Again, two separate large groups, they all disappeared out the um, entrance exit down near um, the cafe. And we had the same experience when we went to Nello Gardens and, um, sorry, not the uh, Crane Park. And uh, there were again groups down by the, uh, the water, um, the river there, and they sort of disappeared quickly. I mean, the, the thing is, there were large groups, they disappeared as soon as they saw the police and say in the instance of Twickenham Green, I mean, the policemen sort of witnessed directly sort of drug usage, taking whatever was going on. I mean, it was interesting to me um, earlier on, Claire had mentioned how, you know, maybe patrols were down at 10.30 in the morning. Well, obviously that doesn't really mean anything. There's nothing visible. There was a tweet the other day about antisocial behavior on the green. And then there was a response from, I think it was Shra say, well, at 9 a.m. at the pavilion, it was all clear, but that's the point. It may all be clear the next day, but this is happening and it is happening very regularly. And you know, we see it all the time. I mean, you almost feel like it's the sort of Cassandra syndrome where you say this, but it's just discounted all the time. But I just wanted to say this because uh, I was with the police and they did you know, um, report it on, on the radio asking, and. I expect, I mean, there probably wasn't any attendance by units because, of course, the police are very pressed and probably didn't have the availability to send anyone down there. But this is a weekly weekend thing that happens all the time. And just because we've passed the summer period where the ASB and defecation urination was appalling, it hasn't stopped. It, it may be less obvious. And, uh, and particularly with people maybe not being out and about as much as they used to be, not less, not as visible. So I just wanted to make that as an observation and sort of, you know, it's not just us as a resident sort of going, oh gosh, this is happening. You know, the, the police reported on the radio as it happened. Thank you. That's, um, that's really helpful to hear. And actually, uh, I'm going to invite um, Inspector Robinson to respond to that in a, in a minute if she can. But I've also logged a 101 fairly recently reporting a very large group of teenagers on the corner of Twickenham Green. Um, so it does seem to me that there are still large groups of, of people who do, do scarper the moment anybody um, appears. So Rebecca, could you respond to some of the points that Barclay raised there, please? Yeah, of course. No, um, thank you. And I, I definitely don't want people to think just because the summer periods are over that we've forgotten um, about the issues, um, the areas that do have those ASB issues. Um, so I did over the summer get the authority for all of the safe neighbourhood teams um, to be able to issue urination tickets. Uh, I know um, Ray P.C. Sullivan that's on this call has did issue a couple of them. Unfortunately, we do have to catch people in the act for that. Um, we do. So as I said before, the, the safer neighbourhood teams themselves only have um, two constables on um, and they work different uh, shifts. They will amend those shifts according to, to where the need is. But unfortunately, there is only two of them. And if we have like we did over the, the summer and over the last couple of weeks, areas of uh, a pop-up events of uh, raves elsewhere in London. Unfortunately, those officers are taken off, which is extremely frustrating for myself and for the teams um, as much as you, because we want to be in, in Richmond delivering the service to Richmond. Um, so if you do sometimes feel like, you know, you don't get the, that visibility, that probably goes some way to explaining why. But again, I would always encourage you to always report this this stuff into us, even if it feels like, you know, I, I, I know 101 can be a, a frustrating system. Um, I don't know if I should say that or not, but I know, like I, I've heard the stories of people calling in and I know it's frustrating, but it really does help us map, you know, especially coming up to winter where we're gonna put those patrols um, and as well areas where with the council, we can try and get design out teams to, you know, work out where to put CCTV, um, 
so it's always helpful for us to hear these hear these areas um yeah thank you and um just another couple of points that have been put into the chat which are, are linked um nigel um has commented about the um people on the roof of the cricket pavilion and you've just mentioned cctv and i just wondered whether there were any plans to um install cctv at the cricket pavilion end of the green um Ray Russ, do you know anything? And so there's a, there's only a sort of a certain number of rapid deployment cameras um, held by the council that uh, police can can bid for um, and put through. I don't know if we have any what the situation is specifically in that area. If Ray Russ, you know? Yes, so there's a mobile camera at the moment of Pope's Grove, which was the area was getting the most amount of calls for uh, for urination in that area. So we deployed a camera there. We can move it. It's, uh, it won't take much to have it move around to the pavilion now that uh, the longer not the darker nights and uh, the groups tend to be congregating there. So uh, yeah, that is a possibility just to have the camera relocated. Okay, that, that's something that I'll leave with you, you then. Um, Richard wants to come in here. Richard Bennett. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes. Obviously, the pavilion is a focal point for, for trouble, loud music as well as drug taking and, uh, and needs particular attention. I mean, obviously, it, it's important that the police arrived and they dispersed or scarpered as it was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you prefer that. But um, it isn't usually the police that are going to be available to, 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 to effect that. And while the council did bring on extra park guards in the summer, mm -hmm. um, there's still 163 green spaces that the council is responsible for, for worrying about. And so that they're spread pretty thinly and they obviously lack the same authority and assertiveness that you will get with the police. So that, you know, that, that's really a, a, a serious problem that it does still require the police to be really assertive about this and disperse people because we can't rely on, on residents doing it or, or even our park guard doing it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would say as well, we um, have been working quite heavily with the with the park guards because it kind of helps to bolster our numbers. If instead of having, you know, two PCs out together, we have one with the park guards um, and they did, especially over the summer, we did actually get quite a, a couple of good arrests um, from weapons that were spotted by park guards. Um, so we do very closely link in with with them. Uh, on the street to, to make that work because obviously we have to be uh, creative around uh, resources. Um, so yeah, and I know um, they did put on extra COVID marshals that we've been working with over the last four weeks as well around, around COVID enforcement. So can I just pick up on that then and maybe yep. ask one of the councillors. Um, it's good to hear that the park girls were being effective and were reporting things that the police could pick up on. Do we still have park girls in the vicinity? Because I certainly haven't seen any since the summer. I don't know if one of the councillors would like to answer that. So I know that they were being used at um, COVID marshals. Um, I know, so they have still been operating Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, I know we've got um, uh, Councillor Gareth Roberts, who actually leads on community safety, as well as being leader of the council, and he may be able to uh, talk particularly to the park guard. I, I just wanted to slightly um, uh, uh, address a comment that Claire had made. Uh, certainly in the summer period, we actually had a specific community conversation for those around Twickenham Green to address and, and, and actually take, take on board the issues that the Green was suffering from then. So, it's not fair to say they haven't been addressed. That they were at the time, um, but perhaps, perhaps we can perhaps I can actually uh, ask Gareth to talk about particularly about uh, our use of park guard. Hello, good evening, everybody. I wasn't expecting to speak this evening. I was just coming along to keep an eye on things. Uh, but yes, we did have an additional enhanced park guard service um, in addition to the uh, park guards that we have patrolling all the way through the year. So. Yes, park guards are still on. I don't believe we have the enhanced service at the moment, simply because we don't have an endless supply of money and it was costing quite a lot of money to be able to 
provide these additional patrols on the hotspots when they were needed. That's what's really needed as a targeted response to deal with specific issues. If we find, which I don't think we will, but if we do find that we have this issue arising again, then yes, of course, we'd look to see what additional resource that we can put in. But um, Piers is quite right. We're also uh, spending um, a grant fund, which we've been given for the COVID marshals, which are also being provided by um, Park Guard. And we have an additional need at the moment where we're targeting resource over in Barnes for the um, towpath for children using that during the dark winter evenings. So what we're trying to do is using the very limited resource that we have to target the resources that we have uh, to make sure that we're getting the best value for your money. Thank you. Are there any more points on um, sort of um, antisocial behaviour on the green, uh, particularly cricket pavilion and so on? We, we can see things in the chat that there's been um, other issues of uh, defecation and other areas. So I'm sure that will be picked up after the meeting. Are there any other points before we... Tony, you've got your hand up. Tony, Jenny. Yeah, I, I would just like to um, say that I walk around Nella Gardens regularly. And um, I'd, would, I'd like to put in a good point for um, young kids, actually, because I think um, they, uh, they do leave a few beer cans around, um, which are often not picked up by, you know, but most of the time they're, yeah, they're playing a bit of music and most of the time they're just having a good time. And I don't blame them for that, actually. Um, there's, you know, there's so many restrictions on us adults and kids these days. I don't want to diminish, you know, defecating and all that. That's awful, you know, and it needs to be addressed. But, um, uh, but I, I do want to slightly balance it because I, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to some of the kids in 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 the park sometimes you know they you know they need they need to have an opportunity to um be free a bit you know and often it is at night when they can feel a bit free to be honest um what i would say uh it's slightly uh, on the agenda is that the nella garden toilets uh were out of action for weeks and in my view, that is completely unacceptable. If the toilets go down, then they need to be repaired within hours, not weeks. And I would like the, the councillors to respond to that and confirm that this will not happen in the future. When toilets are down, they will be repaired immediately. Because, you know, if you, if you want to complain about people urinating, then for God's sake, let's have some toilets. Would one of the councillors in West Ward like to pick that issue up? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, there have been periods when the toilets have been down. That's because I'm, I'm afraid they've been badly vandalised and weren't safe to reopen until, until they could be put back into use. Obviously, particularly, uh, during the COVID period is absolutely vital. Obviously, our public toilets are, are, are in use where they, where they can be, but where they have been heavily vandalised, they have to be closed off until they can be safely repaired. And obviously that's done uh, with our, with our uh, contractors. We, we make sure it's done as quickly as possible. Um, but the, you know, so, so sometimes, uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the damage and vandalism they received and so on means they just can't be, can't, it's not a cosmetic uh, thing to actually get them back into operation again. But of course, you know, uh, our, our, our park officers and councillors are, are really keen that they're put back into use. So it's, it's a community community asset. So there's no way in which we want them not to be used where they can be used. And so where is there a, um, a hotline or where can people report issues about vandalised toilets, Piers? Well, I mean, it, I mean, it's certainly when, they, when the cafe is open, they can report them to them or they can actually report directly to the council. Uh, online and they will get they will get a response and and I know Mr Jenny did at the time uh, I can't say no, every no, instance no 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 can I come you, in you, you there did, I didn't Tony, get you a did. response I did, you, you it, did. it was three weeks later the toilets were repaired and that in my view they were not so significantly vandalized in my view well in, in the, your the opinion, response though. was not prompt enough and I'm afraid that to have when I asked for a commitment 
that toilets will be repaired promptly. And I get a response which, uh, which makes, in my view, I'm sorry to, but in my view, these are excuses. This is like British Rail saying, you know, wet leaves on the lines cause train delays. It's the responsibility of the council to make sure the toilets are repaired promptly. Full stop. Thank you very much. No excuses, David. please. Thank you. And I'm pleased that you stuck up for the young people having a good time. So it's nice to have um, a positive there. I'm aware of the time and it's getting on for quarter to eight. And there's a couple more issues here. Um, I've got um, Chris. I'm sorry, I don't know your surname, Chris, but you've mentioned stolen bikes. Have we got anybody still on the conversation called Chris? Yes, uh, here I am. Hello, Chris. All right, uh, the surname is King, just so that you've got that. Um, the, the question really I was going to pose was, I suppose, for the police, as well as the council to respond to. Um, whilst walking in Crane Park towards the shop tower a couple of weeks ago, I came across um, a bicycle that had been discarded, dumped, whatever, um, by the side of the path. And like most people, I was thinking, oh, well, I'll just walk past. But I thought, no, I'll actually try and do something positive about this. I, I rang the police and said I'd like to report it. It presumably has been stolen. That was an assumption. Um, but I didn't have, didn't have any way of checking that. So I asked if there was a, a, a responsible person in the police who would come along and check the number that may be on the bike or otherwise to see if it's stolen. Because if it was my bike that had been stolen, I'd be very pleased that somebody had uh, drawn it to the attention of someone who could actually return it to them. Uh, the police uh, basically that I dealt with told me that it was a council problem. And when I rang the council, I got pushed back towards the police as it was a police problem according to the council person I spoke to. So where do I turn? Um, effectively, nobody wanted to be interested. I bet the best that was advised me by the person, the council I spoke to, was to report it as fly tipping. Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. Rebecca, do you want to comment first? Yeah, no, firstly, I'm, I'm sorry you got that response um, from the police. Um, yeah, I don't really, I, where is it? Where is the bike still there now? Oh, I couldn't tell you. I haven't been back there for the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, what was interesting is that after I had had those conversations, I walked on up past the shot tower out to the um, Hanworth Road, and there were a couple of police, three, I think, police coming into the park at that point, probably completely unrelated. Um, and I then walked around the uh, Crane Park back down towards the A316, yeah. And I noticed there were a couple more police, different police, actually down there. And I was thinking, well, they can't all be coming to look at this bike. Um, <laughs> just coincidental. But there were obviously a lot of lot of um, manpower around, it seems, at the time. As I say, probably for something far more important. Um, but uh, it was just a way that I'd been pushed from yeah, one no. organisation to the other organisation. Yeah, like, no. oh, well, here I am trying to be good neighbourly. Yeah. But, Good citizen and I'm getting nowhere. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I do completely apologize because you, you shouldn't have um had that response from, from the police um at all. Um yeah, I, I can only apologize for that. Um and I think we're putting up our details for safe neighborhoods. So if you do sort of in future have any issues like that, please do um please do let us know. Because I don't know if you have um, access to the database which um, people have, like myself, have had their bikes marked. I mean, one of your colleagues yeah. mentioned it earlier about marking bikes. Yeah. And so mm. I was thinking, well, if, if that could be checked, if the bike could be looked at and, and the number found, yeah. then we could well, establish whether it is stolen that, or not. Um, well, yeah, exactly. And we can do things like, um, so um, PC Sullivan, who's and uh, Russell on the call um, today, actually did some um 
work around a, an arrest and some stolen property and, and put it up on social media. Um, and the actually the victim then actually walked into the police station to stay um, and the guys were able to source it out. So yeah, that is absolutely something um, we can do. I can only assume without speaking to the officers um, that I, I don't know, perhaps they were on their way to deal with something else or, or yeah, I, I can only assume that that was the case, but um, yeah. No, can I bring in um, Walcott here, who's got his hand up. Do you want to just uh, respond to that, PC Walcott? It's me, it's PC Sullivan. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry you got this response. Um, it, as always, it depends with who you speak to, to uh, how things get, uh, how things proceed. <laughs> The Met policy on, on like uh, bikes found abandoned is if it's a high value item, we will have a look at it to see whether it's stolen. If it looks like it's been dumped, then it won't. It comes under property abandoned in the street. And uh, policy has changed in the past few years where we don't take property that's found in the street unless it's like high value. So that will give you the give you sort of the answer. Uh, if you if you spoke to me, I'd have a look at it and see whether it's just been dumped or whether it can be traced. Uh, all bikes have a unique number on the frame, which is underneath the bottom yeah. bracket, and we record these. If it's no, if the victim who's had their bike stolen knows that number, it will be recorded on our crime report, and we also do bike marking events where those the frame numbers we've recorded along with a bike marking, and it can be put onto. Uh, the bike register, which is an internet database we have uh, details with and we interact with. Would you like to ask another question on the points I've raised? No, uh, uh, it's really not a, not a problem about, I think, uh, establishing whether a bike is stolen, if you can check it against the, the database that's held, um, whether yeah. it's against the frame number or the, uh, the marking that's put onto it to yeah. help protect the bike. I can uh, vouch the bike register myself. It. So it's, it's a marvellous thing. You just log it and you can upload a photograph and it's really helpful. And I would just urge anybody local, um, you know, you can actually, it's, it's free, you just upload it. So I think that's a really useful point there. So anything else you wanted to say? Because I've got um, one more question no, from somebody about cycle lanes. We're going to stick with cycling, if that's all right. Okay, so... Much earlier on, somebody, Jack Fifield, raised a question about cycle infrastructure. So it kind of follows a theme here. Yeah, yeah. So I've been back in Twickenham for, I've grown up here, but I'm, I live on Staines Road and my bedroom literally faces the road. And I've been struck by how many more people are actually cycling on Staines Road nowadays. And especially like a lot of um, youths, as we've been calling them, and and kids for parents and stuff like that have been have been cycling to and from school. But another thing that I've been really struck at is the amount of like speeding cars or motorists or whatever on the road. Like they're going so fast. And I did a, a freedom of information request a month ago, and the council's own data says that they've recorded like in a week that they did it, they recorded 20 cars going above 65 miles an hour on Staines Road at the Mill Road section. The, the road has cycle lanes, but you can park in them, despite the fact that pretty much every house on this street, including the one I'm in at the moment, has a driveway with space, sometimes just for one car, but often two or three cars. And yet the cycle lanes are still always full of cars. There's no parking restrictions where you have to get a permit and, you know, there's no segregation for the cycle lanes. So what you often see is people cycling on the really wide pavement, at which, you know, for vulnerable pedestrians isn't great but then at the same time if you then stop them from cycling on the pavement get, they're going to be cycling on this like road with people going at 65 miles an hour so I was just wondering if if the council had any, any updates on um whether there could be a segregated lane um put on Staines Road to keep people safe. Okay I can see Katie's got a hand up Katie Mansfield. 
Hi, thank you. Um, I, I know Staines Road is in West Ward, but this is something I've been working on as part of the um, Transport and Air Quality Committee. Um, Staines Road is somewhere where we would like to have a segregated cycle lane. It is something that I completely agree with you. It's somewhere that could do with one. Um, the way it's worked this year is we've had to bid for funding from TfL, from the Department for Transport, to try and get money to put in some of this infrastructure forward. And at this point in time, we haven't had any money back from them for um, for, for, Annette, for, for the area of Staines Road. You'll see that when we've got the money in places like Q Road, we have put in cycle lanes and proper cycle lanes where we've taken the parking out and it is much safer for cyclists and we see that being utilised a lot more. So in, in principle, I completely agree with you and it is the direction we would like to go. We can't do it. They're expensive to do and we can't do it unless we get the funds. Jack, do you want to come back on that? I was just wondering if you'd, cons you know, I live on this road myself, I was just wondering if you consider um, putting in resident parking permits because at the moment a lot of people park on the road despite having driveways and you know it, I, I, I know that my neighbour has like four cars like I think that we should be discouraging you know having maybe so many cars because they compared to a few years ago there were a lot fewer cars on the road you know just literally you know parked there so I was just wondering if maybe the existing painted cycle lanes that they're not great maybe if we started charging for parking we could raise some money for local infrastructure and also put the painted lanes back to use again. Yeah, and, and to think, um, I, I might um, refer to um, Piers or Alan on this, um, because with um, control parking zones and get charging for parking, we very much take advice from the local community on where we put those and when we put them in. So, so we don't actively go in to try and get residents parking unless we hear from the local community that it's the right thing that they want and that they lobby us for it. And then we'll go through a full consultation pro process with regard to any specific area asking for it. There's a lot of pros and cons and a lot of people feel very strongly about CPZs um, but certainly if it's something that you think your local community want and, and, and I don't know um, whether there's any history because it's West Twickenham um, from, from Piers or Allen it's certainly something that you'd need to progress through um, getting a lot of buy-in locally. Alan did you want to come back on that? I can see you. Uh, yes please yourself. yeah. Um, I, I think uh, um, as you may know Jack, Jack um, there's a C new CPZ being um, prepared for um, up to Fifth Cross Road at the moment. And when the uh, consultation was put out for that, um, it, a wider consultation was carried out right up to Sixth Cross Road, including all of the Fuller Park Avenue and that, and that stretch of Staines Road. And um, the, in, in the consultation, it came back that that area uh, didn't want to be included in the CPZ. So um, they had the area, we have to go on what the residents in that area uh, decide really. And that may change if, this, if, if the CPZ, um, as the CPZs develop, but um, at the moment, um, there, isn't, there are no plans to draw that into a new permit parking area. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And there's um, several other comments that have been put in the chat about parking, including parking on pavements being dangerous for pedestrians um, and um, disabled users as well. Um, so I think that's something else that needs to be um, borne in mind. Right, we've got four minutes left. I'm just going to take a couple more um, things on that before we bring the um, conversation to a close. Ray, did you want to come in here? Uh, yeah, um, I, I do live on Staines Road. Uh, I slightly disagree with Jack, um, insofar as if you look on uh, Sunday, and, and this is the normal time, you know, the COVID has been slightly different, although it's getting back to normal. That's Staines Road on our side of the road, on the Mill Road side, all the way up to the sort of beef eater, well, let's say up to Manuel Road, it's pretty empty. So, what happens is Staines Road is now a car park. Staines Road is the only place you can park your car for free. So people who use buses, be they going towards Richmond or going towards Heathrow, uh, park up there. Uh, and that, that's the problem. And, and of, course it's a, it's a, of course it fills up that cycle lane 
I've actually written to the council, do you remember some photographs? I think I sent it to Alan and Piers. Um, when I drive out of my drive, I can see nothing. I've got a complete solid row of cars. The only way I can come out of my drive is very, very slowly and hope anyone coming down the road at the speeds Jack's talked about notices me. And they mainly do. Only a few have had to swerve. I cannot see anything. And I've asked for cars to be parked less frequently along that road. I can see it's a problem, but it is a problem. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, I hadn't realised it was a question. I do beg your pardon. I thought you were just raising a point. I'm going to take one more question. This is going to be the last question of the evening. This is Sarah Ford. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, yes, I was. I just wanted to add, make a comment about what Mark was talking about with the White Ribbon Day and the uh, violence against women. Um, I was pleased to hear about it. And I was pleased to hear that the borough is doing something about it. But I also want to know if the borough, well, you know, all the councillors are looking to try and get white ribbon status because violence against women and girls is endemic. And it's the cause of many of a lot of crime, I would say. And the cost, as Mark has pointed out, regarding the murders and um, when women do finally come forward and sometimes it's men. It's, it costs a lot and it's all about um, the education and it comes from a very young age, allowing men to articulate feelings and learn to deal with them. And I want to know if the borough is looking to do white ribbon status. And I'd also like to know um, what they do, what they want to do. If they did that, it would be, it would start a conversation within the borough it would filter down through to all the schools because I don't know if people realize, but a third of schoolgirls are assaulted on the premises. This is a number that should not be acceptable nowadays. So that's that was the root of the conversation I would like to have about not having this being an issue ever again, but it's gonna take years, but I would like to know what the council are thinking about. Thank you. And in one minute, who'd like to answer Sarah's question? If, if you like, um, I'm grateful for the question, Mark speaking. So in relation to the particular status you're looking at, yes, we've recently formed a new Violence Against Women and Girls Strategic Board. We're looking at leading light status for new commission services, and we'll be looking at accreditation across a, a range of um, activities. You're absolutely right. Domestic abuse and these behaviours do actually happen at a very early age. So we need to invest our time and our effort in a coordinated community response. So that is a very long-term vision, looking for generational change, not change in the next one year, two year, three years, but five years, 10 years, and 15 years. So our vision that we're working towards is to work up our activity that will deliver that change. And you're absolutely right, primary school, secondary school, they all have a part to play. And it wouldn't just be about domestic abuse, this is about critical decision-making for young people and informing young people about how, what, how to make wise decisions. I hope that gives you some reassurance. Yeah, thank you. It, it's, um, you're very articulate and I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're spearheading or at least very much part of this on for the borough because um, like you said, it's long-term and it's about um, getting it into the schools. I don't know if you know about the boys initiative, but that's certainly produce some good results and it's Thank about you. men it's the men running it men talking to the boys and the men about this it's something that has to come very much with a male voice unfortunately but I think but it has to to get Thank them you. to see see the role models see it being lived but thank you very much and thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't come to you earlier. As I said, I hadn't realised it was a question. I thought it was a, a comment. Right. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this evening's um, community conversation. So I would just like to um, say thank you to everybody for taking part. I'm sorry if you feel that you didn't quite get your um, 
question fully addressed, but you can carry on this conversation after the meeting. As I said, you'll be um, sent a list of um, attendees to this meeting. So if there's anything you did want to follow up with anybody in particular, I I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you. And I'm just gonna close by saying, we've been hearing about crime and awful things, but we've chosen to live in South and West Twickenham for a reason. It actually is a lovely place. And I know most of us really enjoy living here. So um, I don't want us to go, don't have bad dreams tonight. It's really not that bad, everybody. Okay. Th thank, th thank you, you Helen. Much. I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of the councillors and the council um, for chairing the meeting. Um, you, you've done a great job and we've put some really interesting, informative discussion on the table and it's really going to mm -hmm. help drive what we should be doing going forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Katie. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.